there's this unfortunate overlap in the term multiverse, but there's this whole physical multiverse theory that you exactly. were alluding to, which I don't think of as connected at all with this sort of debate on pluralism in mathematics. It's just a totally separate topic. So, for example, the physical version is connected with, you know, superposition of worlds and whether they can interact and so on. And I think that's part of what your, your question was about. And there are versions of those phenomenon in the set theoretic multiverse, but but I don't think of the set theoretic multiverse as connected at all with any of those physical theories. It's just a different topic. It's a, it has, you know, there's a family resemblance because it's about many different mathematical worlds and the physical one is about many different physical worlds but i think that's the end of the family resemblance and i don't i'm not claiming or positing any kind of uh, deeper connection between the sort of set theoretic pluralism kinds of multiverse and these physics theories that talk about a multiverse i think they're just totally different topics um, but in terms of whether there's interaction i think that's extremely an extremely profound philosophical question on the mathematical side hey everyone welcome to this conversation that i had with professor joel david hamkins logician mathematician and philosopher uh, it was certainly one of the most technical episodes that i've done especially given that i am a complete neophyte to the world of logic and the formal logic um, and the foundations of mathematics although I've been endlessly fascinated with these fields. Um, if I may, uh, it, it certainly is a technical, difficult conversation. There are a lot of terms that we generally aren't used, colloquially speaking, certainly not. Um, uh, and, and I guess uh, a word of advice, if you want to get familiar with these terms, what I did to prepare is uh, I started uh, doing a course on formal logic on Stanford University online. I'll leave a link to that down below. Uh, also, I read this book, Gödel's Proof, uh, by Ernest Nagel. Um, but, but I think now I'd say this was a couple of months ago. Now I'd say perhaps the best book to get into the world of the philosophy of mathematics and logic and incompleteness theorem and set theory and whatnot is to read this lecture series by. Professor Hamkins himself. Uh, it is excellent, uh, regardless of your level. I think. If you have a basic understanding of, of some elementary concepts in mathematics, this series will help you get through. Uh, it covers set theory. It covers all the way from what is a number to the uh, Gödel's Inc incompleteness theorem. Uh, and it's excellent, really. It's one of the best books I've read. You probably can see I've tagged it a lot because it's a book I keep revisiting every time I want to make sense of some concept uh, in, in logic. Professor Hamkins was extremely generous with his time and I certainly am looking forward to having him on again, uh, especially to discuss his work on um, infinity and computationality. Uh, he's also got an excellent substack, uh, which he said, in fact, that he'll be releasing a lecture series on more work on Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, and he'll be re releasing that this year, I believe. So do subscribe to that. I'll leave a link to that down below in the description. And also, I'm glad that I didn't forget this. This is an important point. Um, unequivocally, hands down, the, the, the best publicly available lecture series on the philosophy of mathematics is his uh, Oxford lecture series, where he covers essentially the eight chapters in this book. So if you haven't got time for reading, um, listen to the series. It's free. It's on his YouTube channel. But even better, watch the series while reading the book. That's what I did. That really helped me understand some of these concepts and let them sort of settle uh, in my mind. Saying all that, without further ado, let's get to the podcast. Although before that, a formal introduction. Professor Joel David Hamkins is a mathematician and philosopher who is the O'Hara Professor of Logic at the University of Notre Dame. He was also a professor of logic at the University of Oxford and Sir Peter Strawson Fellow in Philosophy. Professor Hamkins is the author of several books, including Lectures on the Philosophy of Mathematics, Proof and the Art of Mathematics, and The Book of Infinity. I should mention The Book of Infinity is also available on his Substack. Having said all that, um, without further ado, here's my conversation with Professor Joel David Hamkins. Professor Hamkins, you've probably been asked this question uh, in different forms in a variety of podcasts, uh, but so let me try and rephrase it. Uh, given you started your career more in mathematics, what made you uh, go to philosophy? And perhaps you could then expand on what really is the fundamental relationship between 
mathematics and philosophy? I see. That's a great question. And, and I have to admit that I don't really have an answer to it because it's the story of my intellectual life, really. I began, as you said, in mathematics. My PhD is mathematics. My undergraduate degree is mathematics. And, uh, you know, I studied logic and my dissertation was uh, in mathematical logic. And I wrote many, many papers in mathematical logic. And I consider myself a mathematician to this day. Um, but what happened is during the course of my work, the topics started engaging more and more with what I view as deep philosophical issues about, say, uh, pluralism and, and, and so forth, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into. And because of those philosophical aspects of the mathematical work, I started exploring that a little more deeply and, and gradually turned myself into a philosopher. So I joined the philosophy faculty at the City University of New York, where I was, and then eventually um, had an appointment in Oxford in the philosophy faculty there, although I was also an affiliate member of the mathematics department and had math PhD students there, or DPhil students in Oxford, and it's a similar situation now at Notre Dame, where my main appointment is in the philosophy department, um, but I have a concurrent professorship in mathematics. Um, and so, I don't, to me, it's a kind of boundary. It's not so important to draw a line, and I don't draw a line. There's this ample area in common between math and philosophy, particularly when you're studying logic or foundational issues. So you can study them in a more technical way, and then maybe what you're doing is essentially mathematical, or you can recognize that those technical issues reflect certain philosophical positions, and then it becomes a philosophical thing. And, and it my own enjoyment, my own intellectual enjoyment comes really from the interplay between those two kind of uh, things where maybe there's a deeply philosophical question, uh, you know, with a long history or something. And, and one can say, well, what if we formalize it a little bit or make it a little more precise? And then it turns into a kind of mathematical question that you can just analyze as a mathematician. And maybe answer it, answer that mathematized version of the philosophical issue. And sometimes maybe that answer isn't what you expected. And, and it makes you realize that actually that aspect to the answer is feeding into the philosophical position that you might have had. I mean, I can give it a good example of this. Um, it arises with uh, some of the current work on the philosophy of potentialism which, um, I mean, of course, potentialism is an idea that goes back to Aristotle. It's extremely old, the, the sort of philosophical analysis of it, the idea that, I mean, the distinction between a, an actual infinity or, or potential infinity, this is the kind of thing that, that Aristotle was talking about in Archimedes and so on, you know, since that time. And, um, but more recently, people have taken to thinking about potentialism uh, uh, through a, looking at it through a modal lens, through the lens of modal logic as a kind of, in terms of possibility and necessity and, and formalizing, well, exactly what is the modal logic of potentialism? So if we think of the universe as kind of unfolding, you know, in the kind of realms of possibility, and maybe some of those realms are more remote, then we that's exactly the kind of situation that modal logic is really set up. To, to be about, where you have a, a bunch of possible worlds, you know, they could be actual, but they're not actual yet, they're possible, they're merely possible. Um, and so you can define a kind of modal semantics, a, a statement phi at a given world is possible if there's some further world where phi is true, or it's necessary if no matter where you go or how long you wait, phi will be true at all the accessible worlds. And so, so it becomes a kind of question in in mathematical logic, in modal logic, you know what what are the what are the validities of the potentialist outlook, and and if you had the idea of maybe a kind of naive idea of potentialism that well we have some numbers you know zero one two three and so on maybe it goes up to something but we don't have all the numbers yet maybe it's just an initial segment, and and if we wait longer we're going to get more numbers then then the sort of possible worlds are the initial segments of the numbers somehow. And, and in that case, the worlds are linearly ordered. 
And that causes a certain modal validity known as axiom 0.3, which you can write down exactly what that axiom is, but it's true in any linearly ordered kind of system of worlds like that. Um, whereas if you have a different idea that, well, no, I have an idea of maybe possible numbers and, and if a number is actual, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the smaller numbers are actual. Like if you think about say the number a Googleplex, Right. You know what a Google is, right? This is 10 to the 100. Yeah. So it's a one with 100 zeros after it, if you write it in decimal. Um, a Googleplex is 10 to the Google, right? And I mean, a Google, you can write down the decimal representation of it, like, you know, in less than a minute. It's just a one with 100 zeros. You could just write that down. It would fit on a piece of paper and so on. But suppose we wanted to write down the digits of a Googleplex. Well, that would be a one with a Google number of zeros. Yeah, and if you could start writing them down, and I did a calculation once, and if you, if you said, well, I suppose you suppose we we're really good at writing down numbers, and we can write down a million digits every second. Okay, then how long would it take you to write down the decimal digits, the decimal representation of a Googleplex, and even if you wrote a million digits every second since the beginning of time at the Big Bang, you would not even, you would be making only the, the minutest fraction of the digits of a Googleplex. So it's this enormous number, which is kind of mind bogglingly huge. Okay, but we have this simple description of it, right? It's just 10 to the 10 to the 100. So we have this very compact description of this number which is fast but if you think about all the numbers that are less than a googleplex you know like with random digits maybe the easiest way to describe those numbers is basically just to recite the digits if they're if they're really random then that's good that is for most of them that's going to be the, the quickest way to say what the number is so most of those smaller numbers the point i'm trying to make is most of those smaller numbers you cannot even describe them even if you pronounce a million digits every second since the beginning of time. Whereas a Googleplex, we can say it, it's just 10 to the 10 to the 100 and I can give a mathematical definition of it so easily. Okay, so this is a kind of situation where maybe if you have a view of potentialism where just because a number is actual, it doesn't mean that all the smaller numbers are actual because there's a sense in which we can hold the Googleplex as a number, we can hold it as an object of thought in our minds. It's 10 to the 10 to the 100. But there's a lot of smaller numbers that we can't reasonably hold as an object of thought in our mind. And they maybe have only a kind of potential existence, which is not yet actual. And so this is a different conception of potentialism where it's not sort of closed under initial segment. You can have a number is actual, but the smaller numbers aren't necessarily all actual. And in this case, you're not going to validate point 0.3, the point 0.3 axiom. It might be directed which would give you the 0.2 axiom, but you won't have the 0.3 axiom. And so, okay, so my point that I'm trying to make in a very long-winded way here, I'm sorry for going on, um, is that you have some idea of potentialism and maybe you wanna think about it in a modal point of view, but when you get down to the kind of mathematical analysis, these kind of details come up that make you realize, wait a minute, it's actually a fundamentally different conception about whether we want S4.2 or S4.3. These, these are modal theories that describe the nature of those possibilities. And, and, and those different mathematical modal theories reflect totally different philosophical conceptions of the nature of potentialism. And that's the kind of feedback that I'm really talking about. I mean, one can go, I could talk for hours about this particular topic, but uh, I don't know if that's enough for this particular question. No, I see. I, I took note of modal logic and potentiality because I'm certainly going to do some study into it. What was the axiom, Professor? You said 0 0.3. Do you mind just, just, just giving a bit of insight as to what you exactly meant? Sure. The, the 0.3 axiom could be expressed as the, the statement that if... If you have two statements A and B and they're both possible, so if possible A and possible B, then it's possible that one of them is true while the other one remains possible. So either possible A and possible B or possible B and possible A. And that's true. And if, if the worlds are sort of linearly ordered, then 
either A is going to be true before B or at the same time, or it's going to be the other way. So if if the sort of realms of possibility are linearly ordered and both A and B are possible, that means there's some like maybe future time or possible world where A is true and a possible world where B is true, then one of them came first. And therefore in that world, say A would be true, but B would still be possible. Mm. So, right, or the other one came first. So the point three axiom is expressing that whenever two things are possible, then it's possible that one of them is true and the other one is possible. Whereas if you have a kind of branching situation, you know, suppose you're you're at some small world of actuality and possible A is true in this world and possible B is true in this other world, but those worlds are sort of incomparable with one another, even if they have, you know, further worlds above both of them, encompassing both of them. But maybe A is only true over there and B is only true over there and never again. And so you wouldn't have it being the case necessarily that just because they're both possible that one of that it's possible that one of them is true while the other one is still possible because if you made a true then b becomes impossible and similarly with b so it's expressing in a modal in the modal language of possibility uh it's expressing the kind of linearity of the possibility conception so this kind of thing you know this continue many different modal theories s4.2 s4 s5 and so on and and this is quite studied by the modal logicians and i've done quite a bit of work with various applications of modal logic to different kinds of uh foundational setup say in set theory for example in the modal logic of forcing this came up and um and i've done some work with one of my students in oxford um uh, Wojciech Voroshin uh and we wrote a paper called modal model theory where we're trying to um, introduce these modal conceptions into model theory and he in his in his uh, dissertation is working on the um uh, modal logic of, of the category of sets. He has a kind of category theoretic understanding of it. And uh, and also the modal logic of groups under extension and so forth. So it's really um, a lot of different, uh, I mean, the, the basic idea is whenever you have a collection of mathematical structures, maybe say the class of all graphs or the class of all groups, or the class of all partial orders, or the class of all models of CFC set theory, or you know, whenever you have a collection of structures like this, then it often comes with a kind of natural potentialism concept, namely this kind of submodel relation or embeddability relation, right? So, for example, you can look at a given graph and say, well, what kind of things are possible over this graph? And what it means is if I make the graph bigger to a larger graph, you know, what could be true in that larger graph? That's the notion of possibility. And necessity would mean that no matter how you make it bigger, the statement would be true. That would be necessity, right? And and for example, one of the things that uh, Wojciech and I proved is that the two colorability of a graph is expressible in the modal language of graph theory. So to be too colorable means that you can color all the vertices either red or blue so that adjacent vertices, if there's an edge between them, they'd never get the same color. Now we know, I mean, in mathematical logic, we know that two colorability is not expressible in the pure language of graph theory. It, it's a kind of meta concept and you can't, in the first order language of graph theory, you cannot express the two colorability of a graph. But when you have possibility and necessity, then you can. That's one of the things that we proved. It's possible to make a modal statement that's true in a graph if and only if the graph is too colorable. Yeah, I do wonder. I want to ask you about uh, a, a bit of a sociological question on mathematics. Sure. Before that, I do wonder how what you just explained uh, sits along with, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of your ontology of uh, the set theoretic multi versus theory because right. this wouldn't stand in in that sort of world or that sort of reality correct so right so this is uh i view it as kind of related i mean uh, deeply related actually um uh, some of i mean if one takes set theory as a foundation of mathematics which is essentially how it was introduced by zermelo you know over 100 years ago um 
Um, so he proved the well order theorem that the that the reals have a well order and indeed that any set can be well ordered and and he used the axiom of choice to do that or people challenged him you know to formalize his argument and in order to do that he wrote down what's now known as the zermelo axioms of set theory including the axiom of choice in order to prove that theorem and people began to realize it, you know it was corrected by by frankel to add the axiom of re replacement which was sort of missing a little bit from zermelo's set up but people realized more and more that basically this this set theoretic framework had the capacity of um, uh, um, proving the existence of of arbitrary essentially arbitrary mathematical structure so what it meant was that we had this single kind of intellectual abstract realm set theory which was fully general in the sense that any mathematical structure of any kind could could be simulated within it and that was very important for unifying mathematics because maybe before this foundation happened there was there was analysis and geometry and group theory and all these different sort of disparate parts of mathematics with their own axioms and so forth. And it was maybe difficult or maybe incoherent even to think of them all as being part of one mathematical enterprise. Whereas the, the sort of, you know, establishment of, of set theory and with this enormous capacity for representing arbitrary mathematical structure, enabled one to think about all those different mathematical activities that's really taking place in this one realm of set theories, EFC set theory. And, and that was, was very important for helping people to conceive of, you know, what is the nature of mathematics as a whole, all of it, if we view it as taking place sort of within set theory. Now, you know, it's easy to criticize this set theory as foundation of mathematics because the language of set theory is about, you know, sets and the epsilon operator and so on. And, and to actually translate ideas from other mathematical subjects into the language of set theory would not be enlightening. I mean, it, it would be, you know, you would get some really technical, irritating statement in the language of set theory that wouldn't shed any light at all on the mathematical ideas that were important in that other realm okay but that's a kind of you know to ask for the foundation to do that is is in my view maybe a little bit of a misunderstanding of what's what what the claim is and what's going on right there's other kinds of foundations that uh, um, i mean the way maybe one way to describe it is that set theory f serves as a kind of ontological foundation for the rest of mathematics in the sense that in set theory, one can prove the existence of structures that fulfill the uh, features that are being claimed about these other, you know, in these other mathematical realms. So we, we can prove in set theory is the complete ordered field, okay, and we can get real, the real numbers out of that, and we can get the complex numbers, and we can, any kind of topological space and so on, one can view it as really a set with a family of subsets, you know, that define the topology and, 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 uh, you know, and the algebraic structures are, are sets with operations on them of some kind and so on. And these can be easily simulated in set theory. And so in, in ZFC, we can uh, produce this the, the mathematical structures that instantiate the objects that are being talked about in those other realms. And so it's a kind of ontological foundation, but it, the claim isn't that the best way to understand those other things is to translate it all into the language of set theory and to just do set theory, that, that's absurd. Um, whereas other foundational subjects like category theory in particular um, are aiming not just to be an ontological foundation, but rather to be, maybe one could in contrast say something like an epistemological foundation, or maybe that's not quite fully accurate, but rather category theory is, is claiming to provide the framework of ideas that help you to understand what's going on in these other realms, um, uh, which is something that set theory is not really claiming to do. Okay, so now that the sort of pluralism comes in, though, when you when you realize uh, historically or maybe naively, one can think about set theoretic existence and the sort of the, the set theoretic context as unique, 
we, you know, we wrote down the axioms, Zermelo wrote down the axioms and Frankel added replacement and so on. And we, we've added other axioms. Maybe if you think about the large cardinal axioms to strengthen it even more. And, and maybe one has in mind that there's this one set theoretic realm that these axioms are trying to describe. And you could call it the cumulative universe. Um, you know, the idea that, well, we have this intended model of the axioms, the cumulative universe of sets, the universe of all sets. And that's the sort of uh, mathematical background that set theory is providing. Yeah. But, but then it becomes philosophical because we know that there, there cannot be just one model of ZFC. It's a first order theory. And there's a theorem called the levenheim skolem theorem, which says whenever you have a consistent first order theory with an infinite model, then it has many, many non-isomorphic models. So there are many different models of CFC, if there are any at all. And, and so the, the, the theory simply does not determine this intended model. There's all these unintended models that sort of come along, yeah. And then, and then a further difficulty is that, well, what do we mean by this intended model of of set theory? Really, I mean, it's hard to describe it. We can't describe it in any first order way. So we cannot describe it using only the language of set theory because that would just be another theory, which also had many different models. And so it becomes very troublesome and difficult to pin down exactly what we mean by this intended model of set theory. And then with the further independence phenomena that arose in the 20th century with forcing and so on. So a lot of the basic set theoretic, set theoretic questions like the continuum hypothesis and, and others turned out to be independent of the CFC axioms. Yeah. And what that means is that if CFC is consistent, then it's consistent with the continuum hypothesis, and it's also consistent that the continuum hypothesis is false, and and so on. And 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 this was proved by Paul Cohen. And well, Kurt Gödel proved in 1938 the positive one that it was consistent, that it's possible that CH is true, and and then it was open until 19 until the early 60s, 1962, 63, when Paul Cohen proved that. Uh, that the negation of consist of the continuum hypothesis is also relatively consistent with CFC. And so we have this situation now where uh, basically any non-trivial set theoretic statement, it turns out almost all of them are independent of CFC. I mean, the, the expected answer to any kind of question, well, is it true? You know, you ask a set theoretic question, then either it's trivially true or trivially false, or it's independent. This is the observed phenomenon. It's not universally true what I'm saying. I mean, because there are exceptions and deep theorems that turn out not to be independent, even though people thought they might be. Um, but there's thousands of statements that have this same independence phenomenon as the continuum hypothesis, and many of these results are proved with the method of forcing. And this is extremely suggestive, this pervasive, ubiquitous independence phenomenon by which any non-trivial statement is has models where it's true and models where it's false. Because it very much suggests that there's a plurality of set theoretic worlds, right? And, and so this is the sort of view of pluralism is that, yeah, these different models that we're, we can prove exist using forcing, and we can construct them uh, are completely legitimate set theoretic conceptions of the nature of set theory. Uh, and that the idea that there's just one concept of set and just one set theoretic background uh, is a kind of illusion or mirage. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that helps explain. It, it, it does, although Professor, I've got I've got a lot of questions on this, uh, especially sure. because, uh, especially because uh, when I was reading that chapter and listening to your lecture uh, on the set theoretic multiverse, obviously my head went to the uh, current sort of ongoing debate on the the multiverse theory or the let's call it yes. the interpretation in, in quantum mechanics or in physics. Oh, and I the, see. Yeah, I'm I'm so. 
because according to my understanding, uh, what you're putting forward with the like the set theoretic multiverses, these right. separate multiverses, or, or let's call it uh, axiomatic systems for, for, for different uh, worlds of set theory, they, they right. can still talk to each other, whereas I, I, there, there are still correlations, let's call it, whereas uh, I don't think that's the argument someone like a Sean Carroll would make when it comes to physics, where there's this reality, there's another reality. So speaking ontologically, uh, are, are you are, are you claiming that like the nature of, let's say, the, the ontology of mathematics is that, yes, there are uh, some universes where the continuum hypothesis is, is, is it, it works and in some it doesn't. Uh, do, do they have relations or are they completely independent uh, realities, if that makes sense? So that's a good question. So I guess I have a few things to say about it. Um, so first, I think it's probably important to, there's this unfortunate overlap in the term multiverse, but there's this whole physical multiverse theory that you exactly. were alluding to, which I don't think of as connected at all with this sort of debate on pluralism in mathematics. It's just a totally separate topic. So for example, the physical version is connected with, you know, superposition of worlds and whether they can interact and so on. And I think that's part of what your, your question was about. And there are versions of those phenomena in the set theoretic multiverse, but, but I don't think of the set theoretic multiverse as connected at all with any of those physical theories. It's just a different topic. It's a, it has, you know, there's a family resemblance because it's about many different mathematical worlds and the physical one is about many different physical world but i think that's the end of the family resemblance and i don't i'm not claiming or positing any kind of uh, deeper connection between the sort of set theoretic pluralism kinds of multiverse and these physics theories that talk about a multiverse i think they're just totally different topics um, but in terms of whether there's interaction i think that's extremely an extremely profound philosophical question on the mathematical side which is where most of my work is um, namely, uh, so we have these different models of set theory and the method of forcing, and and there is a way that a, a one model of set theory can somehow get access to the forcing extensions because the 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 ground model, the smaller model, has names for all the individuals that exist in the forcing extension. This is one of the ways that forcing works. We have this concept of having a name. And then we have this forcing relation, which tells, which expresses in the ground model, sort of the truth conditions of what could be true or might be true in the forcing extension. And this is a degree of access to the extension. And, and so it isn't like, it's not just this kind of pure S5 modal situation where we have these totally separate set theoretic worlds that don't have any connection with one another. And when you move from one another, they cannot see each other or uh, it's not like that at all. Rather, every model of set theory can look down, you know, inwardly at the inner models that are defined inside it. For example, this is how Gödel proved the consistency of CH. He said, well, take any model of ZFC, and then inside that model, define what's called the constructible universe, which is a kind of uh, constructible version of the cumulative universe, where you only add the bare minimum at each step. You iterate along, and whenever you've got a, a, a sort of set that you've built so far, then any subset of it that's definable in that piece, you add that at the next level. And so you keep iterating this definable power set operation. This was Gödel's uh, uh, genius idea. Then you get this inner model of set theory and he proved that all the CFC axioms are true there, including the axiom of choice, even if it wasn't true outside and the continuum hypothesis also. And that's how he proved the relative consistency of the continuum hypothesis and the axiom of choice by showing that inside any model of CFC, there's this deeper model called the constructible universe that satisfies DFC plus CH. And the forcing extension idea is looking sort of outwardly. It's a, it's a measure of access that a model has to the larger models. They can't have fully complete access and one can refute the idea, you know, this, there has to have to be certain kinds of limits, but there is some kind of access. And, and I find that just fascinating when the uh, 
I mean, it's a deeply metaphysical issue about these sort of possible mathematical worlds with different truths. And yet, the because these worlds, these mathematical worlds, have by by means of the forcing relation this definable access to these other worlds they become mathematical questions with precise answers and you can prove theorems about it and and so it's fascinating when these deeply philosophical metaphysical mathematical metaphysics questions turn into mathematical theorems and maybe it comes back to the first question that you asked me it's really showing the way that these philosophical issues come directly into the mathematics. Yep, certainly. Uh, I would want to get a bit more into your ontology, uh, especially sure. on, on lecture eight, you did kind of towards the end of the, the lecture, you did like uh, delineate what your views on the matter. Are. Although before that, and forgive me, Professor, because I know you've been asked this question many times, uh, <laughs> but what got me interested with your work really was uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Right. And I I'd, I'd claim unequivocally uh, your lecture, which is Gödel's incompleteness phenomenon. It's probably the best lecture I came across uh, on the topic. Oh, great! I'm yeah, so both, both both for uh, uh, you know neophytes, and I'd even say people who are you know familiar with the with the topic. Um, so uh, I know you've done this before. I've I've heard you speak about this in many podcasts. But if you could, uh, you know expound and take as much time as you want um, on, yes, what was the Gödel's incompleteness phenomenon, but also perhaps uh, give us a bit of sociological insights into what really was the attempt uh, in the 20th century by logicists and philosophers and mathematicians to kind of foundationalize mathematics, you know, works like Principia Mathematica with Russell and Whitehead. Sure. Um, and, then, and then maybe pull from that as to where we are at right now and what's the ongoing work uh, happening in the foundations of mathematics. Right. But that's such a, that's a completely sweeping list of topics. I, that you I, I, I told, I'm so sorry. I told <laughs> us, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to see how it's, how it's evolved and developed, but as okay. I said, take as much time as you want. Let so. me see if I can pull it all together. Right. So, I mean, if we sort of place ourselves back in the early 20th century, then there were quite a lot of activity happening. Zermelo had introduced his axioms of set theory and, um, and this sort of formalization efforts had been going on in, in analysis, in calculus with epsilon delta formalism and so on and so um, the, the group theoretic analysis, geometry, foundations of geometry were progressing and the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry and so forth and this sort of rise of rigor had already occurred in many different realms and very exciting things happening in mathematics. But yet there were also these worrisome developments arising with what they called the antinomies, or the, like the Russell paradox, for example. So the Russell paradox is the observation that um, the principle of general comprehension is false. So general comprehension is the principle of set theory, of naive set theory. It seems quite reasonable. If, if you haven't studied set theory much, you might think that there's something attractive about it. It says, look, if you have a property, then you can take this set of all x such that x has that property. That's the general comprehension principle. It says for any property whatsoever, you can form the set of all instances of it. And it seems appealing. Maybe you think that's what set theory is for. I can make the set of all red items in this room. That seems like a perfectly good set. Or the set of all students in my class who got an A last semester. And that's maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. And OK, so it's a really good set. Um, we can easily make lots of sets by applying this principle. And it seems like when we form sets, the set of all prime numbers, okay. The set of all positive real numbers, the set of all, you know, just fill in the blank. This is how we typically make sets. We say what the property is, and then we use that principle to say that there's the set of it. And so, so it seems that there's a lot of sort of, uh, 
a naive attraction to this principle. But Russell observed, no, it's just wrong. The principle is false. It has false instances. And the way that he did it was he said, let's form the set of all sets that are not elements of themselves. If the principle were right, if the general comprehension principle were right, this would be a set. Let's call it R for Russell. So the Russell set is the set of all X such that X is a set and X is not an element of X. Okay. And now let's just observe. R would be an element of R. R is a set, we said. Okay. So R would be an element of R if and only if it wasn't because that's what the membership requirement is to get into R, to be not a member of yourself. So R is an element of R if and only if R is not an element. Paradox. That's not, it's not just a paradox. It's a contradiction. I mean, of course, when they call them antinomies and so on, it's just a polite way of saying, look, we got a contradiction if we don't really understand it. But I think the way set theorists think about the Russell paradox now, I mean, in my book, I call it, I think, the Russell theorem and, and not the Russell paradox. I mean, maybe I refer to it also as the Russell paradox, but Russell proved the theorem that general comprehension is false. And it has a one line proof because let R be the set of all X such that X is not a member of X. But then R is an element of R if and only if it isn't. Contradiction. So it 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 has a very easy refutation, this principle. It's just wrong. And it's as easy to refute this principle as, you know, I think of it as a kind of naively attractive principle that's actually wrong by a very easy argument. And that's what Russell did. It's like denying the antecedent or, you know, just take, take your favorite logical fallacy. It's like that. It's just a wrong principle in the generality in which it is stated. It, ha it has weakenings that are totally fine. In fact, the separation axiom is one of Zermelo's axioms of set theory, namely that if you have a set already and you have a property, then you can take the set of elements of that set that have the property. That's called the separation axiom. And that's totally fine. It's not subject to the Russell paradox at all. Okay, so this is just one of the paradoxes. There were other ones, the Borali Forti paradox and other paradoxes that arose. These antinomies, these sort of troublesome things that they weren't quite sure about at the time. And Hilbert said, well, look, uh, we, we don't want to give up set theory, so we need to get at this issue of these paradoxes. We need to solve it. And what Hilbert proposed to do, it's called the Hilbert program, was... He wanted to introduce a, a kind of finitary theory that we definitely knew was safe. Okay, like finitary principles of arithmetic or something like this. And then he wanted to take that infinitary theory, the set theory, and, and think about the assertions in that infinitary theory. Well, an assertion in the language of set theory is just the finite string of symbols in that language. So we can think of it, you know, in a kind of computer science way. It's just a string of symbols. And, and whether or not something is provable or not in that theory is also, a proof is also similarly just a kind of string of symbols. And what Hilbert hoped to do was to prove in the totally solid finitary theory that the infinitary theory would never prove a contradiction. This is what he wanted to do. That was one, there were two things he wanted to do. One of them was to sort of prove in the weak theory that the strong theory is consistent. But the second thing he really wanted to do was he wanted this, the strong theory to have all the answers. He wanted it to prove or refute any given statement. Okay. So, uh, and this is what he was trying to do. And this, you know, to, to take, in order to make sense of his program, really, he had to introduce what's called the philosophy of formalism, this idea of thinking of the mathematical activity as just a formal game of manipulating these strings of symbols. And there isn't, I mean, one can adopt a more extreme version of it, namely that and, and claim positively that there is nothing more, there is no more meaning behind the assertions of set theory except these strings of symbols, right? It, it's just a, a kind of meaningless game. 
So one can take formalism to, you know, in a stronger way to say that that's all there is to the mathematical activity. Okay, it's not it's not clear that Hilbert had that stronger idea, but he did definitely propose the idea of thinking of these mathematical assertions uh, as just strings of symbols, and we could prove things about the systems by proving things about what's possible to derive in those formal games, in that formal system. Okay, then Gödel arrives on the scene in um, the 1930s and proves that Hilbert's program is impossible, mm -hmm. that there, we cannot do it, it's impossible. And and what he, what he proved was <clears throat> that there's no formal system at all that can prove even its own consistency, let alone the consistency of that much stronger theory. So, so even the totally solid finitary theory that Hilbert was having can't even prove the consistency of that theory, let alone the consistency of the infinitary one. So it's a very strong refutation of Hilbert's situation. Um, I mean, there's another way I like to talk about the sort of resolution of the Hilbert program. Let's suppose for a minute that Hilbert was right. Okay, that that it would be possible to carry out his program. Then, what would mathematics be like in Hilbert's world? You know, so we would have this finitary theory, and and we would, and it proved the finite the infinitary one is safe. And in the infinitary one, we would settle all mathematical questions. But but then, if you think about it, what it would mean is, uh, given any mathematical question we could just start looking for a proof of it in the infinitary theory or a proof of its negation. You know, during the day, we have our army of graduate students looking for a proof of phi. And at night, the second shift, the army, the second army of graduate students is looking for a proof of not phi. And under the assumptions that Hilbert claimed eventually one is one of those groups is going to succeed because it settles all the questions so there's going to be a proof of fee or there's going to be a proof of not fee and we're going to find it eventually and therefore in hilbert's world if he were right then ma every mathematical question would have a kind of computable procedure to answer it you just go and look for a proof and eventually you'll find a proof of it or you'll find a proof of the negation and then that's when you have your answer and then because of the consistency proof you know that it won't ever be both situations right but now we can prove Gödel's theorem using just that observation we already made if we just help ourselves to alan turing's idea because alan turing proved that the halting problem is not decidable there's no computable procedure which given a turing machine program and an input for that program will tell you whether or not it halts. But we just described a method, a computational method, that will in principle answer any mathematical question, including the halting problem. But Turing proved that it, that's impossible. You can't have a computable procedure that solves the halting problem. Therefore, we couldn't have had this Hilbert procedure with the graduate students working by day and night. So therefore, Hilbert's program can't be right. And that constitutes one of the proofs of Gödel's theorem using ideas of Alan Turing. I don't know if that was understandable. It, but... it, it does, or oh, oh, certainly was, Professor. I'm just trying to connect this to the, the only reason Gödel used, because I know he was talking about formal systems in general, but the only right. reason he used uh, Russell's and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica was because uh, it was a, let's call it a, a, a recently uh, sufficient system that tried to build a foundation for math mathematics, right? Like it was purely more more of like a, a sociolo sociological. Uh, it was say, available. Uh, it was like, you know, it was a formal system that was available. But we know now it, it doesn't matter. You can prove the theorem for any formal system that is able to implement 
elementary arithmetic, then you can prove the incompleteness theorem for it. So that choice that he made that you're talking about was incidental. It doesn't matter. And most people are not using Russell Whitehead formalism anymore. Um, I mean, usually when I prove the incompleteness theorem, uh, um, I'm using piano arithmetic as a formalism. Yeah. It's a first order theory of, of arithmetic. It's kind of convenient and easy and very natural. Um, but in fact, PA is much too strong. I mean, it's much stronger than the the theorem applies to even very, very weak arithmetic theories. This, the, the weakest theory I know of to which it applies is called Robinson's Q, which is this theory that has 10 axioms and it's extremely weak and it proves just basically only the extremely concrete arithmetic facts that you can, uh, you know, like arithmetic calculations that you can write down. It doesn't even prove that, um, that uh, multiplication is commutative, for example. But uh, so it's extremely weak, but it's strong enough to prove the incompleteness theorem for any extension of it. So any theory that contains this extremely weak theory, or even any theory that can interpret a version of that very weak theory. So the, the conclusion is sweeping because it means that basically any foundational theory whatsoever is going to be able to have a primitive concept of arithmetic in it that's going to extend that extremely weak theory and therefore will be subject to the incompleteness theorem. So, so it's a sweeping situation where it's not because of that particular choice of theory. It's basically applying to any foundational theory whatsoever. Because if you have a theory and it can't even interpret arithmetic, then it's really not correct to describe it as a foundational theory, in my view. Yeah, also uh, in your lecture, you mentioned, because I've been, when I was trying to uh, teach myself, or let's say, study more about the Gödel's, uh, th his theorems, you said to not spend too much time on uh, Gödel numbering that it, it, it is, oh, yeah, I, I remember you telling me that a lot of people, when, when they try to first try to understand the theory, they, they spend a lot of time trying to get the Gödel numbering system right. Uh, is that because, what, what was your reasoning behind that? Just Right. I mean, it's a kind of pedagogical choice, really. Pedagogical I mean, choice. my view is that, um, it. I mean, in my experience, looking at many people teach Gödel's theorem in many courses, I've seen dozens of different syllaba, you know, course outlines for courses that go over the theorem. And um, and it used to be universal. It's not universal anymore, but still extremely common to spend a lot of time on the details of the Gödel coding, which is important um, if you're going to prove the theorem for theories of arithmetic then you need to have a kind of foundational setting where you're able to interpret the um, uh, the suitable finitary mathematics like finite sequences of symbols and so on and all of that needs to be interpreted in the arithmetic in order to uh, in order to in order for the theory to be able to be talking, say, about the operation of a Turing machine and so forth. In order to formalize those concepts in the theory, you need the theory to be able to talk about finite sequences and, you know, finite sequences on the tape or finite sequences of computational states and, and so on. All of that needs to be sort of accessible to the theory. And, and that's what the Gödel coding and numbering is all about, um, is proving that the theory is strong enough to formalize all those things. But the, the, the uh, one reason why I don't find the details of that formalization um, very interesting, um, I mean, it's definitely important for the argument that one understands what's going on with that kind of coding. But my view also is that it's obvious now because of our deep familiarity with how computers work. We know that when you type your dissertation into the computer, you know, you get this sequence of letters, you know, in your editor, and, and those letters are represented with Unicode numbers or ASCII codes or something like that. And, and ultimately those, uh, those numbers are, are represented with 
you know, with bytes of information in binary. So it's really your your dissertation is really just a sequence of zeros and ones inside of the computer. And it's represented on the, you know, in the memory, in the transistors with high voltage or low voltage or whatever the, the memory states have, you know, these the two states that represent the binary zero and and one. And when and when you're doing operations like cut and paste and so on on the computer, you're 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 moving chunks of those bits around in the memory, and 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 ultimately that's a kind of arithmetic operation on the number, right? Like to to chop to chop off an initial segment of a number really is just dividing it by a power of ten and and ignoring what's coming after that, and and or maybe you. You know, if you want to append another string to one, which just means you're taking the first string and multiplying it by a big power. I'm sorry, I said 10, but I should have said power of two. You multiply it by a big power of two, that's like putting a bunch of zeros in front, and then you add the code of the other one, and that's how you concatenate strings. And so, so we understand, I think, in a quite deep way, how the abstract ideas and, and sort of uh, syntactic features, even of something as abstract as a dissertation, but basically anything that you can type into a computer, which would include any kind of finite mathematical structure. I could represent a graph on the computer, and ultimately it would be, you know, represented in binary in the memory, which is then handled with AND gates and OR gates, which are basically arithmetic operations on those numbers. And so I, so I think we all understand in principle how Finitary mathematical operations are at bottom arithmetic ones by, you know, arithmetic operations on the codes. That's how computers are working. And if we understand, you know, at bottom how computers work, then those are the details of the Gödel coding, right? So in order to prove the theorem, the, the incompleteness theorem, you you don't actually need to prove the theorem about a specific coding. You just need to know really that there is a, a coding. And, and that's what I'm saying is sort of obvious from our experience working with computers. And that's why I find it uh, not terribly important to spend you know weeks and weeks going over the details of those coding. Another reason why I don't like to do the coding that way is that it's filled with ad hoc choices that are of no consequence and therefore it's anti-structuralist because you could have done the coding differently. You could have represented the symbols in a different order or you could have had slightly different means of, of you know, doing concatenation or you could have made different choices in the formalism. And at every step of the detailed girdle coding presentation, is filled with ad hoc choices that don't matter and could have been done differently. And then why should we care about that coding instead of another one? And, and so it's sort of off-putting to study a mathematical subject that's full of ad hoc choices that are complicated details, but which could have been totally different. And so that's why I think one doesn't really get much insight by going through all the details of a particular coding rather than understanding in a deep way how coding works and understanding that actually there's you know huge numbers of different ways of implementing the coding another kind of way of doing it is is to give up on the arithmetic and just say i mean i've seen proofs of the incompleteness theorem that say uh, have an expanded language say we do it in primitive recursive arithmetic instead of just the language with plus time, plus and times and zero one less than, we allow ourselves as a formal operation, you know, a symbol for every primitive recursive function. Um, and then, you know, the coding is just a primitive recursive function, the concatenation function and the, you know, the delete character K function that takes a code for a string and deletes the character K, you know. So these are all primitive recursive functions you can prove. And so if your formal system is already capable of handling those primitive recursive functions, then the need for coding everything into the language of arithmetic in the sense of plus and times only is, uh, is abandoned. And so that's another way of getting around it. Or, I mean, a, another way to do the incompleteness theorem is to formalize the whole thing in set theory to take finite set theory as your theory. And then it's a little nicer because we already know 
from using having used set theory as a foundation of mathematics. I mean, in set theory, we can talk about sequences and topological spaces and any mathematical structure whatsoever. And in finite set theory, you can talk about finite sequences and finite topological spaces and finite orders in exactly the same way. And, and so the finite set theory is fully capable of interpreting the syntactic formal system because uh, it's concatenating symbols and building trees of, you know, proof trees of symbols and, and having finite sequences of computational states and so on. And all of these it can be implemented in set theory in exactly the same way that we just ordinarily use set theory or think of it as a foundation of mathematics. And, and, and from that point of view, the, to actually go into the details of the girdle coding is similar to what we were dismissing earlier is going into the details of how it is that partial orders are encoded in the language of set theory, which is something that we said isn't a source of insight. So it's exactly the same kind of phenomenon going on when you use finite set theory as your basic theory for the incompleteness theorem instead of arithmetic. Yeah, because, uh, you know, again, for a neophyte like myself, I've be, I, I, I was told that this book, uh, Girdle's Proof, but right. like, it's quite a good book to, to try and firstly get into the uh, incompleteness theorem. Although majority of this book, uh, and this, this book was written around 100 years ago, uh, or close to 100 years ago, uh, is spent on uh, Girdle's numbering. And right. I, in fact, found it much harder to get into understanding the theorem itself because they spent so much time focused on the uh, the Goethe code, uh, and right. and then when I came across your lecture and then you know chapter seven in this book, I was like, oh, I see what Professor Hamkins means. Uh, but anyway, that's just a side point there. Right. Um, so I'm actually writing a book now, uh, and I'm going to teach a seminar next autumn uh, on this topic: uh, ten proofs of Gödel's theorem. So I'm yep. going to. I'm going to give all my favorite proofs of the theorem and related things using all the different uh, attacks on it that I know. So there's the Turing argument that we just discussed, but then the fixed point argument of Gödel and Tarski's theorem approach and so on. And there's many different ways of, of proving the theorem. Um, and I, I'm, I'm certain that I'm going to have a chapter on Gödel coding in there, but it's definitely not going to be the main focus. And uh, in a way, it's something that you sort of have to do uh, in order to uh, substantiate the claims that are made, but uh, I don't view it as a source of insight. Yeah, that's so great to hear. Will that be available publicly? The uh... Well, uh, I think, I mean, I've, I've been this, having this practice. I have the substack stack infinitely yes. more dot X, Y, Z, wow. and I've been serializing all my books sort of a new chapter every week. Um, it's uh, uh, a lot of it is subscription, but also there's a lot of free content there. So I'll probably be releasing it, you know, week by week uh, next autumn uh, on, uh, on on my Substack. Excellent. Yeah, I shall leave a link to your Substack down below too, uh, Professor. Um, so uh, back to the incompleteness theorem. Um, I I kind of want to discuss more on like where you get your ontology from, um, whether and how it's related to the incompleteness theorem because. Uh, you know, just to reiterate, the theorem states there are, there are two theorems. The first one is any formal system has truths uh, that cannot be proven within that formal system. And the second one is that this system itself can't prove its own inconsistency. Now, its own consistency, right? Its own, its own cons uh, consistency, sorry. Um, of course, uh, that said like that, that sounds very abstract, but then and then there's like the the myriad you know books like uh, Geta Lesher Bach by Hofstadter, yeah. which again highly speculative. There are all these different uh, theories of mind, theories on AI computation. So, well, to to put the question plainly, uh, how how is it that you know as you call it this this incompleteness theorem was a phenomena and and a phenomenon in the 20th century, and what why are there such grave uh, philosophical implications? And then maybe the the latter part of that you could even answer how much the theorem has had influence on your own ontology, let's say. Right. Oh, great questions. Yeah. So I mean, the way I think about it is, uh, okay, the incompleteness theorem, Gödel's theorem, tells us that it's impossible for us to ever give to describe a complete account of what's true. We can't write down 
we cannot have a computable procedure for enumerating all and only the true statements of mathematics. That's really how I think about what the theorem is saying. It's saying that truth is too complicated for us to describe in its entirety. And so any theory that we can write down is going to be only part of it. But there's lots of theories that we can write down. We can write down the piano theory. We can write down Zermelo's theory. We can write down category theory. We can write down type theory. We can write down all these different theories that are attempting to express what's true in the, in the foundations of mathematics or a kind of foundational system. But the point is that none of them is ever going to be the full story because that's impossible. That's what the incompleteness theorem tells us. We cannot ever describe some foundational setup that's got the whole story in it because for any formal system, there's going to be true statements in that system that we can't prove in that system. Regardless of what it is, I think it's this kind of sweeping claim. And so what it means is that Mathematics is essentially creative because whatever we think we know, well, there's going to be more things that we have to still figure out and, and the, the setup won't tell us. And so it's a kind of prediction that Gödel predicted the independence phenomenon of set theory by which everything is independent of ZFC and, and, and each other. And, and furthermore, it's not just that those statements are independent, but that they're not even settled. Uh, I mean, the consistency strength of the statements is, is a kind of hierarchy. That's the content of the second incompleteness theorem is that because the statement doesn't even prove its own consistency, then there are these kind of statement, other statements that do prove the consistency of that previous one. So that the second Gödel's theorem predicts that there's a kind of vast tower of theories of enormous height, which are, which are increasing in this consistency strength. So no, none of the theories can even prove the consistency of the higher ones, but the higher ones can prove the consistency of the lower ones. And this was something that we observed directly in the large cardinal hierarchy of set theory, because we have these large cardinals, inaccessible cardinals and Molo and hypermolo and and uh, uh, Ramsey cardinals and so on, measurable cardinals, strong, super strong, strongly compact, super compact, huge, you know, and so on. So there's this enormous hierarchy of these strong axioms of infinity, and, th and they instantiate this predicted phenomenon because none of the theories, none of the large cardinals can prove the consistency of the higher ones, and all of the higher ones always prove the consistency of the lower ones in a very robust manner. And, and so Gödel's theorem told us that, look, there's going to be this hierarchy of theories that are increasing in consistency strength. And we found it. The large cardinal hierarchy is exactly like that. And, and there's no top to it. There can't ever be a top to it. We cannot describe an unbounded pattern to it, because that would just be a theory that we would be describing, and that theory would be inadequate according to the incompleteness theorem. So, so there's no way we can finish the project of the large cardinal hierarchy. I mean, we found this extremely um, elaborate hierarchy of axioms in the large cardinal hierarchy, but it's impossible for us to sort of finish it precisely, again, because of the incompleteness theorem. So, so this is why I say that the um, uh, any serious foundational study has to be undertaken in light of the incompleteness phenomenon, because it, otherwise you, you're missing the main phenomenon that you cannot do it. You cannot describe a complete theory that, that's going to be foundational. Um, uh, that's yeah so this is how i think about the incompleteness theorem is leading to this extremely important principle that governs any kind of approach to foundations of mathematics that they will always be incomplete and inadequate and they will always come in these towers these hierarchies of theories and so if you're if you're going to undertake some philosophical investigation in the foundations of mathematics or the philosophy of mathematics um 
then you should be thinking in terms of incompleteness and hierarchies of theories rather than the single description that's solving it all. Yep. So uh, then, Professor, unlike your uh, graduate advisor, Hugh Wooden, uh, why are you not a realist? And I believe you subscribe more to pluralism. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming when I read that part of, uh, of, the, of the book, you did mention the incompleteness theorem in many parts and that that did influence in your, your thinking. Yes. So I don't I don't know if I agree with the premise of the question because I consider myself a realist, but I'm a pluralist. So maybe that's what you mean. So sometimes, I mean, I can say uh, the, there's some terms that people use whose meaning has maybe changed over the years. So when I was a graduate student many years ago, <laughs> um, at that time, when someone said a set theorist, if they said they were a Platonist, it implied monism, the sort of singularism view, the universe view. Um, whereas my view now, I think it doesn't imply that anymore. Uh, and I've argued strongly that it shouldn't imply that Platonism is about the, re it should be about the real existence of the mathematical objects. I mean, as opposed to sort of fictionalism or, um, or or formalism and so on, which are maybe denying the real existence of the mathematical structures. But just because you're a pluralist doesn't mean you can't also be a realist. And maybe it's helpful to think about the case of geometry. In geometry, almost everyone is a pluralist now because we have Euclidean geometry, we have hyperbolic space, we have elliptical space and so on. There's many different geometries, but I think most geometers are realists about geometry. They think that Euclidean space is real. The, you know, the, the abstract structures of Euclidean geometry are real in the same way that numbers are real. I mean, if, if one is a realist, but also of hyperbolic space. One, one can be a realist about both flavors of geometry or all the different flavors of geometry. You don't have to deny realism in order to be a pluralist in geometry. And that's how I think about set theory also. I'm a pluralist in that I think that there's many different conceptions of set theory with their own set theoretic worlds and they each have a claim to be an instantiation of the concept of set and they're all real. So I'm a realist, but I'm a pluralist. So, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. not I mean, it doesn't answer why I'm different from Wooden. I mean, I, I admire not. Hugh Wooden very much. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, but he's definitely uh, uh, following the universe perspective. And he thinks that there, there are unique, definite answers to set theoretic questions, facts of the matter about whether any given set theoretic statement is true or not. For example, I think on that, uh, on that monist view, the continuum hypothesis is an open question. We don't yet know if it's true or not. But, but there's a fact of, of the matter about it, right? This is what it means to be a universist. Um, the pluralist take on the continuum hypothesis is that, well, uh, you know, it's true in some of the con conceptions of set and it's false in other ones, just like the parallel postulate. It doesn't mean we have to give up on real existence of the sets just because they come in these different flavors. It's like saying that the geometric pluralists would have to give up on the concept of parallel lines or something just because, you know, in, in Euclidean space, they they don't intersect, but in the other, you know, hyperbolic space, well, I mean, there's multiple parallels uh, through a point uh, in the hyperbolic space. So but they, they can think of all of those lines as really existing. And, and I think of also the, the different concepts I've said as really existing. Yeah, see, I mean, if you don't mind, just for the listeners, sure. uh, in your book, if, if I'm just going to quote this bit, because I think you beautifully encapsulate the idea. You say here, uh, this is in page 297 in lectures sure. on mathematics. You say, I argued in Hamkins 2012 that Platonism should concern itself with the real existence of mathematical and abstract objects rather than with the question of uniqueness. And I believe that's where you're saying, well, in this uh, pluralistic view, whatever that exists, they do really exist in, in, in that sense, right? It, right. Well, that sentence was exactly the point I was just trying to explain. Namely, the, the term Platonism 
uh, should not be reserved only for the universe view. I'm a Platonist. I consider pluralism a Platonist view mm. because, I mean, if one is a realist Platonist, if one is a re if one is a realist pluralist, then this is a kind of Platonism. Platonism is about the real existence, not the uniqueness of the concept of set. So, so that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Uh, right. If, I mean, it used to be that if you said I'm a Platonist, you meant that you you follow the universe view, but that's not true anymore. I think. And that's what I'm trying to argue for in that sentence that you just read. And what I've been trying to argue uh, in my remarks is that uh, to say that you're a Platonist is to say that you think mathematical objects have a real existence in the Platonic realm. And, and if you're a pluralist on set theory, then you can maintain that even though you're a pluralist, just like the geometer is a Platonist, even if he thinks there's Euclidean geometry in the Platonic realm and also hyperbolic space in the Platonic realm. I don't know if that helps clarify. It's, it certainly does. And in fact, this is a, a, an excellent segue uh, to this point which you made, which interestingly is sort of a hunch that I always had until you put words to it, which was in multiple podcasts, you, you, you stated that uh, physical existence is in fact harder to understand that abstract existence. Uh, and that's something I certainly subscribe to uh, because, uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, elucidate that. But Professor, what, what do you mean by that, by that, by that claim that in fact, right. the abstract world is easier to understand than the physical world? I mean, I've had any number of philosophical conversations with people or it seems to come up quite often um, when people are expressing a kind of, maybe skepticism about the existence of abstract objects, or people mount philosophical programs that are attempting to give an account of the nature of abstract existence in terms of physical objects. Like maybe they'll they'll say, well, the you know, numbers are corresponding to like collections of physical things, or you know, or they'll try to have some kind of reduction of abstract objects to mm -hmm. physical things as a way of giving an account of this very problematic, in their view, abstract existence in terms of the comparatively clear, according to their view, physical existence. And, and my view is that this attempt is hopeless because it's exactly backwards, I think, that the, the, the abstract existence is the one that's easy to explain. And the physical existence is the one that we have no idea what it is. I mean, the more physics you know, the more mysterious it becomes. I mean, you know, well, we have, you know, you uh, maybe you have a, you know, a rock sitting on the table, but what, what is that rock? Well, it's a collection of atoms, molecules, and so forth. And what does it mean for it to be sitting on the table? Well, there's, you know, electrical forces and binding forces that prevent the rock from passing through the table and so but well so there's i guess you know electrons and and protons and neutrons and so on and quarks and so on and well okay maybe electrons aren't really actual things because it's really just this wave function this probability distribution and so on and so on. and it just becomes more and more kind of mysterious the the deeper you go into the explanation of what it is for a rock to exist physically you know a particular rock sitting on your table that i think one is ultimately stymied you can't really give a any kind of full account of what it means to have this physical thing existing before you to say what it means for it to exist physically i think it's a profound mystery actually i mean of course we all have familiarity with physically existing things that i'm holding this pen right here and and i'm sitting in a chair and and of course you know i drink coffee and so forth and so i have abundant experience with physically existing things and i understand it at that kind of level but to give an intellectual account of what it really means ultimately in a detailed full way seems impossible to me i can't even imagine how such an account would even begin but when it comes to giving an account of existence for abstract objects it seems like 
you know, well, one can imagine how it would begin. And, and, you know, it seems like it's maybe not that hard for particularly simple cases that I've mentioned maybe in these podcasts that you saw, like to say what it means for the empty set to exist or the set containing the empty set. It seems like, well, for the empty set, we're talking about maybe predicates that are never true when instantiated by any object. And I can start talking about what it means to predicate and so forth. And, 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 and you can sort of see how it would go to explain what does it mean to say that the empty set exists. And the more that one is talking, the sort of the better the explanation would get, I think, and the fuller it would be. In contrast to the case that I was describing in physics, where the more you say it, just the more mysterious it becomes. And so, so I view the the sort of reduction of abstract objects to physical to the physical is as extremely misguided and unhelpful and that uh and i reject the idea that somehow it's abstract existence that's the problematic case and physical existence is the clear one uh, this is just not true um and and i don't think anyone has a good account of what it means to say that something exists physically right i'm not sure if that answered your question. no I, it's it certainly did because one other point you made uh in i believe this was matthew's podcast was that i find that especially if you know you could probably blame neoliberal ideology for this uh a lot of people who work in uh like let's say logic or mathematics that work in let's say ab the abstract realm there's this, I feel like there's this pressure that, oh, whatever you do, it's got to have kind of like real, quote unquote, real world consequences. It's got to have like, you know, either be a physicist or a computer scientist. But you were saying that, no, in fact, uh, it, it shouldn't always be consequentialist in that sense, that it's it's okay to work. In fact, if that's something that interests you, you would even uh, encourage people to go and work in logic and mathematics even though it's quote unquote not in the real world, let's say the physical world. <laughs> I don't know anything about the real world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the real the real world is boring, Professor. I mean that, that's why that's why I read your books and listen to your lectures because the real real world. Is <laughs> yeah, I I mean certainly I don't think that uh, I don't think it's necessary that one should only study mathematics that's going to help us build a better toaster. Uh, <laughs> I think there's really profound insight that we can come to even when the mathematical ideas have no practical application at all. They're still quite beautiful and amazing and worthwhile to figure out these ideas about infinity or provability and truth and so on. These are just um, uh, beautiful, profound ideas that I'm so glad to have been able to spend so much time thinking about, and I would encourage anyone to try to do that themselves. Certainly, uh, Professor, I'm cognizant of the time, although before uh, I let you go, I would love to ask you about large cardinals. So we are making a sudden leap back to set theory here. Uh, so you, you said it in, in, your, in your lectures and in the book too, that uh, the large cardinals are the strongest known axioms in mathematics. Uh, so do you mind um, just giving a brief overview of why you, you, you claim that? And if we end this, if we have the time, uh, I'd also like to get to uh, Tarski's theory of truth, the semantic theory of truth. Sure. I don't have much to say on that, but we'll start off with the, the large cardinals, if that's okay. Well, the so the large cardinal axioms, I mean, they're, they're quite old. So even Hausdorff was talking about inaccessible cardinals. So the, these are assertions about the existence of these enormous infinities. So I can tell you what an inaccessible cardinal is, for example. This It's traditionally the smallest large cardinal, but now we know there's some smaller ones. And But I can tell you inaccessible. Um, uh, if you think about the smallest infinity, sort of the all of zero or omega called sometimes, the, the infinity of the natural numbers, you know, it has a couple of interesting properties. Namely, if I have a finite set, to be finite just means to be smaller than all of zero. If I have a finite set, then its power set is also finite. So if the set of all subsets of a finite set is finite. If you have a finite set, it has only finitely many subsets. You know, it's two to the N. If you have N elements, there's two to the N many subsets. But two to the N is also finite if N is finite. 
So that Aleph zero is closed under the power set operation, in other words. Because if I have something smaller than Aleph zero, its power set is also small. And another interesting thing about Aleph zero is that it has the property that if you have fewer than Aleph zero many numbers, each of which is smaller than Aleph zero, so in other words, if you have finitely many finite numbers, then the supremum of them is also finite. I mean, it's sort of obvious. If I have finitely many finite numbers, then there's a the biggest one. And the supremum is the biggest one. It's going to be less than all of zero. It's going to be finite because it's one of them. Yeah. Okay. So now the question is, so that, that property is called regularity. It's the property of a cardinal. Is A cardinal is regular. If you take fewer than that many cardinal number of smaller cardinals then the supremum is still smaller hmm. it's not true for olive sub omega olive sub omega is the first cardinal which is bigger i mean olive zero is the first infinite cardinal olive one is the next one and then olive two olive three and so on olive omega is the supremum of all of those olive sub n's where n is finite but notice what we just did I mean, from Aleph 1 and above, they're all uncountable. They're all bigger than Aleph 0. But Aleph Omega has this property that it was the supremum of a countable set of smaller cardinals. So that means that it's the supremum of a small number of small cardinals. So it's not regular. Aleph Omega is not regular. Okay, so the question is, well, could there be a regular cardinal bigger than all of zero, which was also closed under the power set. So that would be called a strong limit, a regular strong limit. And that's exactly what it means to be inaccessible. An inaccessible cardinal has both of those properties, but it's bigger than all of zero. It's an uncountable regular strong limit cardinal. And it was hypothesized, you know, they didn't know whether there was one or not. And it was ultimately proved as a consequence of the incompleteness theorem, you can prove that ZFC cannot prove that there is an inaccessible cardinal, you know, unless it's inconsistent. So, and the way that you can prove this is if kappa is an inaccessible cardinal, then you can build the set theoretic universe up to kappa and chop it off. And you can prove that ZFC holds in that realm. But that would mean if ZFC proved there was one, then it would prove that there's a model of CFC. And so it would prove its own consistency. But by Gerdos theorem, that's not possible. So therefore, you cannot prove that there is an inaccessible cardinal. And similarly, if you assume there's one inaccessible cardinal, you can't prove there's another one. You can't prove that if you assume that there's two, you can't prove that there's three, and so on. So by positing the existence of these large cardinals, we get this tower of consistency strength. Because if I have 17 inaccessibles, it implies the consistency of having 16 of them and so on for any number, including infinitely many. And so that's maybe giving a little bit of explanation of how this, this large kind of hierarchy starts to grow and, and it starts to be stronger in consistency strength. And, and this strength, this consistency strength property is what I meant by the strongest known axioms in, in mathematics. Because if you go to some of the non-set theoretic foundations like category theory or type theory and so on, then unless the unless the systems are explicitly adopting large cardinal assumptions, which they almost never are, um, then they will not be able to prove the consistency of the large cardinal existence assertions in set theory. So in that sense, the large cardinal hierarchy are stronger consistency-wise. There's going to be no way to interpret those large cardinal theories in the other systems without explicitly adding in the large cardinal ideas to the foundation. And so there is a kind of dispute that goes on in the philosophy of mathematics and in set theory, the philosophy of set theory, um, about when we make a foundation of mathematics, do we want a really strong theory or do we want a really weak theory? It's two different approaches to what we're trying to do, right? Now, normally in mathematics, when you prove a theorem, you want the hypotheses to be as weak as possible. 
because then it's more applicable. It applies in more cases, right? And so there's a very natural inclination that mathematicians have to say, well, we always want it to be as weak as possible that suffices to prove, you know, for the purpose. So if you prove a theorem, you want the hypotheses as weak as possible. So if you're proposing a foundation of mathematics, you would want it to be as weak as possible such that you can still do all the mathematical stuff that you wanted to do in it. And that's, I think, a defensible answer. But an opposing answer is no, 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 because a foundation of mathematics is trying to do something different than just be the framework on which all of that mathematical activity that has already taken place succeeds. What it's trying to do instead is identify the true principles at the bottom of mathematics. And, and in that, from that point of view, you would want it to be as strong as possible, but still true, right? Now we know we can never have it be complete because of the phenomenon that we talked about before. We cannot ever have a foundational theory that, that knows all the answers but we're trying to get as close as we can, right? And this is the kind of strong foundation attitude, which is generally pushing one towards these large cardinal axioms. These are the strongest axioms that we have. And a lot of people think that they're consistent and that they are expressing a, a deep and coherent foundational idea. And, and, and they have consequences, even in arithmetic, these strong, these strong assumptions of infinity have arithmetic consequences that you cannot prove without them because they imply consistency statements and consistency statements are fundamentally arithmetic assertions. So in other words, all of these large cardinal theories imply that certain polynomial equations have no integer solutions, but none of the weaker theories can prove that. So there, there are definitely consequences, even arithmetic consequences of these strong, of the mm. strong uh, large cardinal theories. Okay, I've, I've said, I think on, on many occasions that there's this unresolved dispute between the weak foundation camp and the strong foundation camp that I think is philosophically extremely rich and I encourage people to engage more with it. What are the reasons why really we would want weak foundations or what are the reasons why we should favor strong foundations? And uh, you know, and how does this dispute play out in the case of set theory or category theory or type theory and so on? Um, and uh, I think that more work should be done investigating this kind of thing. Excellent, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Um, we are over time. Uh, therefore, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't know. Have you Have you got maybe five minutes to comment? On... Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. I'm really grateful. Uh, so, uh, I, again, uh, Tarski's theory, a semantic theory of truth. Um, right. Which I mean, from the surface, it just states if P is true, if and only uh, if P. Uh, and it, it kind of, I I can see what Tarski is saying, but. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on his theory of truth and also uh, given with the Gödel's incompleteness theorem, why he came up with this theory. Uh, so uh, the way I think about it is, is this, there's really two, two, as, two angles to approach Tarski's theory of truth. So, I mean, on the one hand, there's this disquotational theory, which is what you just mentioned, namely that P snow is white is true, if and only if snow is white. I mean, the sentence snow is white with yeah. quotation marks is true if and only if snow is white without quotation. So it's this quotational theory because in effect we're removing the quotation marks, right? That's what truth means to say that a sentence is true is just to say the sentence. And so P is true if and only if P. Uh, okay, this is a sort of criteria about what it means to say that something is tr true. And in a sense, one can view it as um, deflationist. It's saying, look, any truth assertion can simply be eliminated by applying the disquotational rule. So we don't need ever to talk about truth. All right, and, and that view, I view as, uh, as quite good for sort of one-off, isolated uses of the concept of truth. But Tarski has this other theorem, Tarski's non-definability of truth. I mean, it's sort of funny because Tarski is credited both with defining truth because he defined the satisfaction relation in model theory, you know, this double turnstile thing, 
by applying the disquotational theory, he defined what it means to say that a statement is true in a model. But he also proved this theorem, which is called the uh, the non-definability of truth. So he both defined truth and proved that it wasn't definable. But uh, there's no contradiction between them. It's just this kind of apparent. Uh, it's sort of like Gödel proved the completeness theorem, and he also proved the incompleteness <laughs> theorem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's just a kind of coincidence of the superficial yeah. contradiction that isn't actually a contradiction. Okay, Tarski's theorem says that there's no way of expressing the truth of a formula in terms of its Gödel code. Okay, so I mean that's one way of we can talk about it in terms of Gödel codes. So. We cannot express in arithmetic, say, the concept X is the code of a true sentence. There is no arithmetic way to say that. And uh, and and one, or for example, the one way that I like to describe it is like this, saying not, not about sentences, but to, to say that um, there's no way in the binary case. There's no way to say that y is 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 a sentence that's true at x. We cannot express that in the same language that the y's will be about. Okay, and and one can prove it just like in the Russell paradox, um, uh, because uh, it's like the um, what is it the Grelling Grelling Nelson paradox this sort of autological. So say that a concept is is autological if it applies to itself. So um, polysyllabic is autological because it it is polysyllabic. It has many syllables, mm -hmm. or um, uh, uh, or maybe uh, short is autological because it's a short word. It's not a very long word. Yeah. So, um, okay. So some words apply to themselves and sometimes they don't. And if it does apply to itself, it's called autological. And if it doesn't apply to itself, it's called heterological. So monosyllabic is heterological because it's not monosyllabic. Yeah. It's It's got several syllables, right? Okay. So now let's think about heterological. Is it heterological? Okay, well, let's think. Does, does the, the concept of being heterological apply to itself? Well, if it did, then it, well, no, that can't be right because then it shouldn't apply to itself because that's what it means to be heterological, right? So it doesn't. But if it doesn't apply to itself, then it is heterological. Not like Russell's so it's, paradox. It, it's exactly the logic of Russell's paradox. Yeah. So let's prove Tarski's theorem using Russell's paradox. Yeah. If we could express that Y is true of X, then we could express heterologicality, because that's just saying it's not the case that X is true of X. So if we could express this binary relation, y applies to x, then we could also express the one where y and x are the same variable, that x is not true of x. But that's exactly expressing heterologicality. Mm. Yeah, and, and therefore we would get exactly the same contradiction as in the Grelling-Nelson paradox, which is basically just the same as the Russell paradox. Because notice Russell was x not element of x. And heterological paradox is X is not true of X. It's yeah. the same exact logic in both cases. In right? semantics, yeah, yeah. Okay, so therefore, Tarski's theorem is true. I mean, because Tarski is saying, look, you cannot express Y is true of X. If you could, you could express the heterologicality property, but you can't do that one because you get the Russell contradiction. So therefore, you can't express the concept Y is true of X. Um, all right, but now we can prove Gödel's theorem from this, and this is this method of proof is going to be one of the chapters in my book, Ten Proofs of Gödel's Theorem. So, okay, you prove Tarski's theorem using this heterologicality Grelling-Nelson thing, which is basically just the Russell paradox, and we don't need any Gödel for it. 
But now we combine it with the observation that provability is expressible in arithmetic. Because to say that X is provable is to say there's a finite sequence of syntactic things that obey the rules of the proof system and they have X at the end. And so provability is expressible in arithmetic, but truth is not. So they're not the same. That's the incompleteness theorem. Mm. That truth and provability are not the same. You know, there must be true things that are not provable. You, if there weren't, they would align, and but they don't align because provability is expressible in arithmetic, but by Tarski's theorem, truth is not. <laughs> I yeah. don't know if that helps. It, it, so, and then are you saying it's as a result of that he put forward the semantic theory of truth? No, no. I think uh, the semantic theory of truth came earlier. It was really, oh. you know, at that time, it was sort of shocking how little they understood about what it means to say that something is true or that something is provable. That every, even these big name people were. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but they were confused about these, what we consider now to be basic notions in mathematical logic. Fair, fair. Yeah, it was, it just wasn't clear until like, right. I mean, Gödel's dissertation in which he proved the completeness theorem was, was, you know, right around that time, 1930, what is it? 1931. 1931. 30, yeah, okay. 31, uh, that's when the, these notions started coming together in a way that we would accept as rigorous now. But even slightly before that, people were very confused about and sloppy about what it meant to say that something was true or provable, or maybe they were conflating these. And 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 Gödel, you know, Gödel's theorem is the one that sort of straightened us out about that that we cannot conflate them. And and my way of understanding Tarski's theorem just now is is another way. Of, of, of seeing that, but I don't know if Tarski realized that even when he defined his notion of satisfaction, the disquotational theory that came before the non-definability of truth yeah. theory. So that was later. Yeah. Well, to be totally candid, Professor, I guess for you it's surprising, but for us neophytes, <laughs> it, it isn't. I totally, I totally get why it's really hard to understand what truth is. Uh, but certainly uh, the lectures do help. Um, saying that, thank you so much for going over time. I really appreciate it. Oh, sure, uh, no problem. It's and I, to I, had to, I had to make a bit of a side comment. I hope you don't mind. It's a bit of a personal one. Um, when I told my partner that I'll be having a podcast with you, the, the first thing she complimented was your impeccable uh, sense of fashion. Uh, <laughs> your suits. I and, uh, and I didn't tell her that. I didn't tell her I'll only wear a suit like that the day I become a professor. I, I feel like I, I need to own it. You know? <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor. And also, as I said, uh, thank, I, I shall leave the links to uh, all your work uh, down below. And oh, yeah, just, just on that. So you said the lectures might be available publicly, right? The 10 proofs uh, for good. I think the chapters will appear on my Substack, Substack. on infinitymore.xyz. Yeah. Great. I shall uh, leave a link to that down below.